we want to welcome you uh, no matter who you are and when the last time you were here, if it was last week, if it was last year, whatever, if it's the first time today, we're glad you are with us today. Believe that God is going to speak to you. Uh, we are in week three of this series, if we can pull that slide up there, called The Uncomfortable Truth. And uh, we're, we're pressing in on some things that you need to hear and that you need to learn and that might not be so comfortable to learn such said a thing or whatever, okay? Got that? We started off as uncomfortable as it could possibly be a couple of weeks ago. We started off with a sermon on pornography and how it's sin and how it's eating up the church and how it's eating up people in our uh, in, in our society and that it, it it's, it's definitely a sin. It's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Oftentimes women struggle in silence and confusion. Men often struggle in fear and shame. We actually did a survey of several people in our church, 20 men, 20 women, and we got some information there, and we, and we, we came to this conclusion, and this is really what we wanted to ask, uh, is just to get the tip of the iceberg here. Are you willing to fight when it comes to this in your life? And we want men and women who are willing to fight against this sin, and we want, we want to get in the trenches with you if you struggle with it, so you need to know that. I'm, st I'm still getting feedback from that sermon two weeks ago. Last week, we kind of went in the opposite direction with uncomfortable stuff, and we said that God is so good it makes us uncomfortable sometimes. His grace is enough. It's clearly shown through Jesus. Jesus' first command to us always is to is follow me. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter what we're doing. That's what Jesus calls out to us. And when we belong to Jesus, we belong to God eternally. God's grace is a reward for our faith, and in Christ we can't escape that grace uh, it's there with us. And so today, here is our title slide for today. I've, excuse me, I've called this, Listen Up, all right? We're going to be talking about prayer today, prayer. I, I mentioned it with the kids up here, um, and uh, we're going to be discussing this truth that, that we need to be listening to what God is telling us. It's not a suggestion, it's a need. If we don't listen to God, if we do things our own way, it will lead us down a sinful path. It will lead us to destruction. Um, and, uh, and, and we're all called to pray. We're all called to pray. And um, here's what I know about prayer. I think for everybody, I think this is universal. You can nod if, if this is true for you. We have a hard time with it. Because it is our way God has given us through His grace this way to communicate with Him, the creator of the universe. And so every time we go into prayer, we start thinking about everything but God, don't we? Don't we get distracted in prayer? I, I, we do. It's, it, the enemy wants to distract us and pull us away from that communication with God. And it's really tough. And so, listen, we, um, I'm going I'm to touch on that in a little bit, but we're going to look at this really cool story in Scripture to display the power of prayer, and I want to give you four specific things to pray for today to advance your walk with Jesus. If you're in here today and you belong to Jesus, we want to help you advance in your walk with Him. We want to help you to grow closer to Him. Uh, we've all been to a place where we have prayed, and we've attempted to pray, and we get distracted, and we get uh, discouraged, and we get confused, and we get all these things going on, and we get frustrated over God's seeming unanswered prayers. And I don't know about you, but I kind of get to my, listen, sometimes I get to this place where prayers become almost, I've shared this a little bit with you in the past, almost like just little mantras or little chants. They don't even, they're not even like that real, right? I mean, we sit down sometimes for to eat our dinner and we want to make sure that, got to pray, got to pray before you eat. Got to pray for you eat or you're you going to get sick, right? So you got to pray before we eat. So we sit down and pray. And we're like, good bread, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. So that's our prayer or something along those lines. And then we, sit, or we, we, we tuck our babies in at night, you know. And y'all can play along with me here and repeat after I say because it makes me go to a place when I, it, it, uh, prayer distraction. Can I talk to you about prayer distraction? This is what happens uh, sometimes. You know, we, we, we lay our, our girls down and, and they repeat after, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And then something clicks in my brain, and I go to this place I probably shouldn't go. And as soon as I say that, I go, hush, little baby, don't say a word. 
And never mind that noise you heard. And then and man, the girls get all scared and they start looking at me like I'm weird. And I'm like, it's just the beast under your bed. And I, no, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. Y'all are like, what? What are you doing? If you don't know Metallica, that just went right over your head, all right? That's Inner Sandman. Um, but like, we kind of do that, right? And we start thinking about these things. And so, or, or, or here's what we do in prayer sometimes. Here's what we do in prayer sometimes. Some of y'all be like, I'm tucking my baby in tonight and I'm going to tell her that. Um, we start thinking that God doesn't understand us unless we speak holy. Like, we got we to gotta break into KJV. And again, listen, y'all, I've preached from KJV before. I like King Jimmy. But, like, we think that God don't understand it unless we kind of get all holy on him. You know, oh, our Father, how greatest thou art. And, we're, and, like, we don't ever talk that way. But when we pray, we do. Like, God hears that better. Or I've been around some people who think God's deaf and they have to yell. Lord, and I'm like, what? I mean, so we get, it's confusing at times. And what I want to do today is this. I wanted, I've been around people like that. I've been, I've been in, man, can I share this with y'all? I'm not making fun of people. Y'all like, yes, you are. No, I'm not. Um, I've been in groups of people that when we pray, and I mean, well, we live in a great community, and there's just, there's all kinds of people everywhere. And like, it's like, well, let's get together and have a community prayer. And we're like, all right, so we get together and pray. And then there'll be like 80 people around. And it's like a contest to see you can pray the loudest. And then everybody yells and everybody screams and you're like, I can't pray. I don't know what's going on. Because everybody's yelling and screaming. And then uh, and what happens is everybody, everybody kind of like fades out of it, except for the three or four loudest people. And they're the last ones praying. And then when it gets to the loudest one, they're like, Amen, Amen. And everybody goes, Amen, and then walks away. It's the, it's the weirdest thing. I've been there. Some of y'all have. Some of y'all are like, I don't know what you're talking about. Just it happens. But I want to talk to you today about how to have an effective prayer life, and we're going to look, if you've got your Bible, turn to 1 Kings chapter 18 in the Old Testament, and um, I want to give you some background here. I've preached a message over the first 40 verses of this chapter before, and I want to look at five or six verses um, after that today as we talk about this, and um, the, the, the sermon I preached, and it's been a couple of years, I had a fake altar up here. And I talked about how the people of Israel would bring things, uh, and they like they they worshipped false prophets, uh, Baal being the main prof, or, or the main idol that they that they worshipped, the false idol. And so they would kind of bring their things to the altar. And, and we we talked about the things that we put on our altar to worship instead of God. And that day I had like a a sports jersey, and then I you know I put some other things up here, like a fake. I put some fake drug fake drugs up here. You know, because people like to, they put that above Jesus in their life. We put a little six-pack of brew up here, and I had to hope, no, no, all right? Like, it, it was, it's bad, all right? Because, you know, we put that above Jesus in our life. We, 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 we live for the weekend. Some people live for the weekend and not for Sunday. Not for Sunday. They live for the weekend to escape the reality of their life. And so... This, the background here is, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this passage of Scripture is, it goes back to about 875 B.C. So this is a long time before Jesus is on the scene. It's like, and I know the first inclination that you're going to have or some people would have is like, well, man, that's, so out, that's almost 3,000 years ago. That's so outdated. There's no way that it could apply to our lives today. Because I think what happens is, Sometimes we read the Bible and we go, that was so long ago. People have changed so much. And those people back then were so holy and so good. And they were so close to God because God just talked to them and they did, whatever, they did whatever he said. People don't, listen, people are people. And we're going to look. We tend to think it's outdated. This is what was happening during this time. Tell me if it, if it draws any parallels to today. People were living in rebellion against God. They were involved in idol worship. They didn't really believe in God. They didn't live their lives as if God really had any presence. The government was corrupt. <laughs> All right. It was so bad that the kingdom of Israel split into 12 into two different um, kingdoms, the northern and the southern kingdom. You had the 10 tribes, 10 tribes in the north, two to the south. You had these people come on the scene named Ahab and Jezebel, and if you've ever heard the name Jezebel, you're like, ooh, yeah, I know that Jezebel, bad Jezebel, all right? And they're living in such rebellion that the prophet Elijah, during this time, he says, hey, look, it ain't going to rain till I say it's going to rain. 
God has told me to tell you, like, this is your, this is how, you know, it, it's not going to rain. So for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And I want you to imagine, we tend to read that and we kind of just gloss over it. How bad conditions would be on our earth if it didn't rain for three and a half years? What the world would look like? What society would look like? And so, basically, they're involved, the people of Israel are involved in this idol worship, and the main idol that they're worshiping is, is named Baal, and there's 450 prophets of Baal, that, and, and Elijah stands up one on 450, one on 450. You will talk about a brave man, and he challenges them all. He says, hey, you 450 guys come down here, I'll meet you down there. Y'all can call to your God, you can pray to him, and let's see, whoever's God bring, whoever. Whoever's God brings fire from the sky is the real, authentic God. And so he says, y'all could even go first. And he lets 450 men, I mean, think about this, like 450 cry out to their God. And he's there by himself while 450 of them are crying out to Baal. And you know what happens? Nothing. That's right, because he's not God, all right? And so they're crying out. And Elijah, he's talking smack. This is in the Bible. I'm not making this up. He is talking smack to 450. All right? And he's basically, he's saying, like, they're dancing. They're cutting themselves. They're crying out. They're doing all this. And, you know, Elijah's over there going, maybe you need to yell louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Yell louder. You know, he even says, he's like, he can, maybe he's in the bathroom. I, I didn't make that up. That's in the Bible. Like, that's the kind of smack he's talking, all right? And they get done. They do this for hours on hours, and they're calling out to their God who does absolutely nothing. And then Elijah goes, boys, get out of the way. Let me show you who my God is. And remember now, it hadn't rained in three and a half years. Think about how precious water is. He takes water, and he just pours it all over the altar. And then he, and then he digs a trench around the altar, and he, pours, he fills it up with water. And they're probably going, man, what are you, what's he doing? And you know what God does? He sends a fire that consumes it all. And then, and so I'm sure the 450 guys are like, dang. But then they're sent down to the valley and they're killed. So that, that's the Bible too. I don't want to gloss over that. They're, so they're, they're, they're punished and they're killed. So now I want you, this is where Scripture picks up. So Elijah, this is a pretty big thing, right? I mean, like this is a pretty big moment in his ministry, all right? But now the miracle is about to happen. Because it hasn't rained for three and a half years. The land, listen, the land didn't need fire. What did it need? It needed rain, all right? So keep that in mind. All right, so this scripture is good. So I've kind of given you a background of the story, all right? This is where we're at. This is what happens next, beginning in verse 41. We're gonna, I'm going to do my best to read through it without interrupting myself because we're going to break it down, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you that I will interrupt myself. All right, verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. So Ahab went to eat and drink. I want to stop there for a minute. This is what I read the Bible. I'm like, Ahab, think of what Ahab just saw. Ahab's there. He's king. He saw 450 dance for hours and cut themselves and yell and scream and nothing happened. And then he saw Elijah get up and go, uh, watch this, boys. God, do your thing. And he sees fire come from it. So you know what Ahab did? Well, like when Elijah told him to do something, Ahab went to eat and drink. That's why I was like, I bet Ahab was like, you got it, buddy. I'm, I'm going. I bet he didn't hesitate. This is what Elijah did, though. He climbed to the, to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. And I'm going to get back to why that's so important, why he does it right now. So important. I'll get to that later. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Remember, he's talking about there's a, rain, there's a storm coming. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. That's, that's a tiny cloud, right? Rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to heaven, tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. So this is what happens next. Soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way 
to the entrance of Jezreel. And we'll get into that in just a moment. But I want to break this down today. And I want to give you four things to pray for in your life. Four things to pray for in your life so that you can keep moving forward in your relationship with Jesus. Because you know what happens in our relationship with Jesus? We get stuck. We get frustrated. We get in this air, these places where it's stale. So I want you to continue to move forward. The first thing that you can pray for is this. Number one, pray for purpose. Pray for purpose. I've talked to many people, Christian and non-Christian, and as that observe the human race. I, do y'all like to people watch? I, do, I love to people watch. All right? And not in a creepy way. I just like to watch. I like to be like, what's, what are people doing? And you know what they do? You know what I see from a lot of people? This is like the land of the living dead. This is like the zombie apocalypse has happened. Because there are a lot of people walking around, they might as well be dead. They have no purpose, they have no passion, they have nothing in this life. They just walk around, they're just like, got up this morning, gonna, gonna do my thing, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna go to bed. I'm gonna eat some supper, go to bed. I'm gonna get up tomorrow, I'm gonna do the same thing all over again. It's all good. That's what, that's, do you know how, that's how many, that's how a lot of people just live their lives. They, they just, it's like, get up, go to bed. Get up, go, no, no passion and no purpose, all right? I want you to have purpose in your life. And I want you to read this, this one verse right here with me. And all these things that just happened, Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink, for I hear, I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, but Elijah knew that something was coming. He had spent time with God. He had been praying. God was stirring him up. He was stirring the storm in Elijah before bringing the storm outside of him. And I would ask you this question today, and this is for everybody in here, because you have an answer to this question. What is God stirring in your heart today? Because everybody, God is stirring something in your heart right now. He'll always stir your heart before things start to happen in your life. I want you to ask God, what do you want to do in me, God? What do you want to do in me? What is it that you created me for? Everyone in this room was created on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose. Everybody. God's got a plan for your life. But here's, here's the thing. We don't know what God's plan is too often. And again, I, I want you to hear my heart on this because I'm going to, by the way, there's going to be a lot of personal details about my life in here today that I want to share with you about because this is God has really spoken to me about this message and he's shown me some things this week as I've prepared. So I'm going to be sharing some personal things with you. Nothing, it's nothing like earth shaking, but things that I'm going to just, it's how God spoke to me and, and what he showed me this week. But God has got a, a calling in our life, but so many people, they never find it because this is what we do in prayer. I'm guilty. I'm not condemning you. I am guilty of this too. Too many people ask God to do for them instead of asking God, God, what's your purpose for me? We spend so much time, oh, Lord. Lord, please help. I, I, again, I'm not coming down to you. We spend so much time asking God to help us, we don't ever ask God, God, what is it you want from me? Show me why you created me. And some of you have this calling and this knowledge of what God wants to do in your life and your heart. When I said, what is God stirring your heart about today? You knew right away. Some of y'all didn't even have to think. God's had something on your heart for a long time. It could be something as simple as this, talking to that person at work. Speaking to your mom or dad or to your aunt or uncle, or, you know, Uncle Eddie or whoever it is, crazy, whatever. I like talking talk to this person, talking to that person, you know, spending more time with your family, reading your Bible, having family dinners together. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it could be, all right? And some of you have it, and God's stirring your heart, and I got news for you. When God starts to stir your heart, he ain't going to stop. So there's a couple of things you need to do. If God is stirring your heart today and he's calling you to action, I want to give you two quick words of advice, and I want to do this in love today, but I want to tell you, A, A first off, stop procrastinating. You've been putting it off. You know that God is calling you to do something, and you're putting it off. And we can procrastinate ourselves out of an incredible blessing. Because, you know, listen, how many of y'all, and you can just nod, how many of you procrastinate about important things in your life sometimes? 
<laughs> Somebody raised two hands and started dancing. I'm sorry. Look, I want to tell you something. This is what we do, and I want you to hear my heart. And again, this is no condemnation. This is who we are in our humanity sometimes. We pray, and we say, God, show me. Show me. Show me. Right? And we want, it's like we want this path laid out perfectly in front of us, and for us to see everything clearly, and I want all the answers before I ever move. I want all the answers before I'll ever move. And I want to tell you today in love that you will never get all of the answers. It's why this walk with Jesus is a walk of faith. It's why it's a walk of faith. You'll never have all the answers. Pray, seek God. Listen, you got to stop procrastinating. God's stirring your heart about something. Take that step of faith and trust him. Trust him. So stop procrastinating. And then real quick, this letter B, uh, don't be afraid of criticism. If God's put something on your heart, listen, I, I, if you start doing what God has called you to do, I've got news for you. You will be criticized. It's going to happen. It's coming. But stop putting it off and stop being afraid. Pray for purpose. And secondly, this, I want to encourage you today, this second one here, and we'll look at some scripture as well. Pray for vision. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. I don't even have this in my notes up here. I just, as I was thinking about this, I've actually preached on it before, talking about the vision of the church and just in our lives in general. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says that where there is no vision, the people perish. We need vision. A lot of Christians go through life blindfolded to the fact that God wants to work around us. And you know what happens? And here's what happens. I, again, I'm going to say it again just so you'll know. I preach to myself about as much as I preach to y'all because this is, this is me in a nutshell. This is what happens as Christians. We get so comfortable in our surroundings that we don't see the greater need. We don't see what God is putting out there. And what I would say is that, like, here's, I'm, th th this is something personal. And this is the smallest thing. You're gonna, you are gonna. You may even listen to it and be like, I don't even get what you're saying. But I, I want to share what, like, our daughters, um, six and four, and we've been homeschooling Zoe. And she's a little social butterfly. And, like, we're trying our best. But she's already told us, she's like, I want to go to school. I want to see other kids. I want to be around other kids. I want to go to school. All right? And so we're like, all right, you know, so we're kind of, we started thinking about this, and it's just where we live. We live about halfway between here and Bryson City, and, um, and so we've been looking into it a little bit, and there's a good chance we're going to send her to East Elementary down in Swain County, all right? That's just probably where, that, probably where we're going to wind up sending her if we can get her in down there, and, um, and I got to thinking about this. I, I got to thinking about this. This is the funniest thing. I mean, we don't have anything against any schools. All schools are great. great. It's all good. Public education, it's all good. It's all good stuff. All right, well, I got to think about this. Where we live on the four lane, on the way, like between here and Bryson City, we live right off the four lane. From here, we, as we're going down there towards Cherokee, we take, her, we take a right to go up to our house. When I, come, when I leave my house every day, when I leave my house every single day, and I get to the four lane, 90% of the time in my life, if not more, I take a left. 90% of the time, I take a left, and I come this way. It's because everything in my life right now is up this way. The church is here. I go work out in Cullowee, I see people up in town, I eat lunch up this way, El Patron, y'all got it, okay, you get it, right? But it's, it's, it's easily, nine times out of ten, when I get to the bottom of my hill, I take a left, and that's where I go. And what God laid on my heart, this is the craziest thing, you know what, it was this, it's about, your life's about to change. If, you, if, you, if your daughter goes to school down here, you're going to take a ride every day. And this is a crazy thing, and y'all are like, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> and some of y'all are, are going to be like, Bryson City? Cherokee? Really? God spoke to me and said, there's untapped potential down here. People you've never met. Things down this way you've never seen. People you've never invited to church. It's all good. I've got all my contacts in Silva. Like, my wife won't go to Walmart with me because I know everybody here. And God's laid on my heart, you need to get to know everybody down in Cherokee and Bryson City too. So when you get to the bottom of your hill every day, you're going to start taking a right, and I'm going to send you this way, and this is where a lot of your life is going to be down this way now. 
and it just it, it just opened my eyes up to the fact that there's a, a, a all new people and a, and a whole new I don't know just harvest out there of people that that God's never laid some of and again y'all are like Bryson City yeah man Bryson City we love it. it's good it's all good it opens up this whole new field of life and 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 it really kind of overwhelming and I started thinking about it it's going to change everything y'all have ever had to take a new job before or maybe you've had to move maybe your life's changed in a big way it got me thinking if we start taking my daughter to school it's going to change our lives in a huge way and God gave, gave me this vision of like reaching more and more people and doing things for him and in verse 42 this is what the Bible says for Elijah. It says, you know, so Ahab, remember Ahab's like, yes, I'll go eat and drink. Um, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. I think it's safe to say that if we're looking in Scripture right now, remember what, Eli remember what had happened. One against 450, he had God on his side. That's all he needed. But all these prophets, nothing happened. Elijah's up there. He prays, fire from heaven. I think it's safe to say this is what we would call a ministry victory. This would be a high point. Like if I was writing my resume, right, to like be a pastor somewhere, I'm like, I went to the top of Mount Carmel and I prayed and God sent fire. And uh, there were 450 people, nothing happened. And God sent it when I prayed, right? This is a ministry victory. And it would be very easy for Elijah to be like, look at me. Look at what's going on. It'd be very easy for me as a pastor at this church to be like, you know what, we've been here for five years. Pretty much we focused all our attention up here in Silva, and we've been trying to get people here and there. And we're good. It's all good. And God has been good for five years. But he has, to he has showed me that there is more out there. And what he's showing Elijah right here, Elijah, even though he has this great victory, what's the first thing he does? He goes and prays. He goes and prays and he seeks God. I mean, he, he knew that God wanted more, and didn't, he didn't just stop at success. And so I would, I would encourage you to pray, God, what do you want to do around me and teach me to see people the way that you see people? Have you ever thought, like, we sing this song, Give Me Your Eyes. Everybody in here has heard it. We sing it, and people like that. Like, do you really want to start seeing people the way God sees people? It's going to cost you. Hey, you know what that's going to cost you, don't you? A lot of love. You're going to start loving people. You won't talk to your spouse. The way maybe you've been talking to them. You won't ignore your kids and act like they don't exist. You start looking at people the way that God looks at people, it'll, it will rock your world. Listen, you pray, God, teach me to see as you see, and I'm going to tell you something, God will mess you up, and we need to be messed up. You'll see people in circumstances totally different. So pray for vision, and then thirdly this, pray for faith. Pray for faith. Elijah is praying like crazy for rain. Look at this scripture, this next passage right here. I think it's verse 43. He says, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked and then returned to Elijah and said, I don't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. I bet you during that seven times, like one of those times Elijah's like, all right, God, any time now. Any time now. You got to know that his faith was tested. His servant comes back seven times and says, there's nothing. I'm sure he felt em empty, and I believe there's a lot of people today that feel empty. And, and listen, and you're going to continue to feel empty if you don't listen up and step up to the life that God has called you to live. What's going to happen is this. You'll pass on that emptiness to the next generation, and they'll have no purpose either. And we want to, what we want to do is this. We want to see lives change for God's glory. And it starts with us, and it starts with you, and then it starts with passing that on to these kids and to these younger generations, because I'm going to tell you something. Y'all, listen, I live in the world like y'all live in the world, and you know what I know about the world? It don't want Jesus. Needs Jesus, doesn't want Jesus. And I know that a lot of people are giving up on God, and, and they don't think anything's there, and and the answer might just be right around the corner. And I believe that, listen, if God hasn't answered your prayers, here's what I believe. I believe it's one of two things. It's either not his will or it's not his time. And I will tell you this, and this is a straight-up truth. That my wife could tell you this, and I, I'm, I, we had this conversation a while back. 
I have believed since summertime. I've, I, I, I told her in the summertime, I said, God is doing something big at Refuge. I don't know what it is, but something's going on. And what Scripture tells us is this, is that, when, that, that in order for us to bear more fruit, there will be times when he prunes us. And there's been some pruning going on, and I'm being really, really open and honest with you. We've lost a few people here at this church, and they've went on their own way, and we have no hard feelings, and that is fine. Some of them have moved. We can't, you can't really control that, like to different geographical locations. And some people have just decided they're going to go to another church. And while it, while it hurts us, we, have, we are putting our faith and trust in God, not in them. And we're saying God's going to do greater things. He's pruning us for something better. And I believe that. And you know what? He laid that on my heart in summer before it ever started to happen. And then I'm like, you know what I've been doing since then? All right, God, you can make it happen anytime you want. We're waiting. And my wife has told me, she goes, are you really waiting? She's asked me, are you really waiting or are you kind of demanding God do something right now? It's going to happen in his time. It's going to happen. And in verse 44, this is what Scripture says. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. Because if you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. He knew the rain was coming when that first cloud was there. He kept his faith. And so I would, I would pray, if you're struggling today, pray, God, what is the next step you want me to take? What is it, God? You've been stirring my heart. It's different for all of us. Your next step, listen, it's different for all of us. And you go, well, what's your next step? You know what I think my next step is? I'll be taking a ride at the end of my road. And I'm going to open up a whole new field of people to go share Jesus with. God's going to open it up. And I don't know what's going to happen. It may just be, hey, I just want you to take a right and go talk about Jesus. That's what it is. And listen, I know whatever it is, you're probably a little bit scared. Like people go, well, that's, that's no big deal. So your daughter's going to be starting school, and maybe you're going to be going in a different, like you're going, oh, Bryson City, real scary. Uh, have you been to Bryson? I'm just kidding. Um, I love Bryson City, man. Gateway to the Smokies, right? That's what they say. Um. And people go, well, that's not a big deal. That's no big deal. It is, too. It's a big deal to me. I mean, I've been, I basically spent all of my time in ministry and everything I've ever done in this town. We're going to continue to do things out here. We're going to do upward in the spring out at the rec center. We're going to continue to be involved in this community and do these things. But God's like, hello, there's an untapped resource right down the road. I want, I want you to go share Jesus and see what you can do down there. And we got folks that make the trek up here from Bryson City, but we're going to go, we're going to tap into a lot more. I just believe that. And it's a little scary. I mean, you know, I've been working out at the same place for 10 years. I've been, ta- I've been going the same, I've been doing the same thing for 10 years. And now God's saying, I want you to do something different. That can be scary. I mean, I remember I, how scared I was when we started this church. I was scared to death, and here I am five years later, and I'm still a little bit scared. It's all right. God's got it. He's got this. All right? Verses 45 and 46, look at what Scripture says, and I'm going to point out something really neat here in a minute. And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm, and Ahab left quickly for Jezreel. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. God gave it praying. God gave him strength. Can you imagine this? All right. Here's like Ahab's gone, man. He's in the chariot. All right. The horses, they're going, man. And then here comes, here comes Elijah. See y'all. I'm out of here. He runs ahead. That's what Bible says. He ran ahead of the chariot and the horses. And God gave him that strength. And I know what we do. I, I said it earlier. We read the Bible and we go, yeah, that was 3,000 years ago, man. Elijah was like this special guy. Some people thought when Jesus came, he was like Elijah. That's how special Elijah was. Nobody's ever looked at Shane and been like, I think that's Jesus. Right? I mean, like, they looked at Jesus and said, I think that's Elijah. And so, you know, Elijah, when he walked around, like he, like, he must have, like, had this, aura around him or something i mean this that was three thousand years ago god doesn't do things like that he wasn't just a man he was special he was a prophet god spoke through him that's what we want that's what we like to think when we read the bible that's what we think from time to time 
But I want you to look at this right here in James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Elijah was as human as we are. He was no different. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. One man prayed and God did what hadn't been done in three and a half years. And we tend to think like, that's just, that, that's, that's, that's special. It can't happen for me. Yes, it can. Pray for purpose. Pray for vision. Pray for faith. And lastly, this today, number four, this is huge. Pray for trust. Pray to trust God. I have thought about this so often as a father. And so many of you are going to know exactly what I'm saying here when I, when, I, when I talk about this because you've got much more wisdom than me in this area because your kids are a little older. I've got a six- and a four-year-old daughter. And they pretty much do what I ask them to do. They're pretty, they behave pretty well. I, I, I feel like there's going to come a point in their life when they reach the age of, oh, I don't know, let's say 10, 11, 12, 13, they're going to rebel in some way. And they're going to, it doesn't matter what I say, what I do, at some point they're going to rebel against what I tell them to do, and they're going to have to learn a lesson. And my wife and I have talked about this several times. And we're like, is it, isn't this the question I think all parents want answered, or they, they just they pray about this. God, don't let our kids be those kids. Let my kids behave. I want my kids to be the ones who don't turn the other way. And, it's, and it almost seems like a silly prayer because everybody's like, good luck with that. They're going to do their own thing. And my wife and I have talked about this. Well, how do we get them not to? Don't tell me just because because like, I get this. I'm hard-headed, okay? And I get this idea in my head. I'm like, why is it that just because everybody else does something, my kids got to do it too? Because I don't believe that. I think that's a bunch of, I almost said it, garbage. I almost said something else. I think it's garbage. And so, and my wife's been like, well how, well, how are we going to get that to be different with them? I go, well, there's no guarantee. We can't. Maybe they will. I don't know. But you know what we can do? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to build such a trust with them that they understand. Listen, they can try to do their own thing, but they're going to know by the time they start making their own decisions, Daddy has never done me wrong. Daddy is not going to lead me down the wrong path. I know that he loves me. I trust him. He wants what's best for me. He's going to tell me what's best for me, and he is here to take care of me. And I try to tell them every day. I know they get tired of it. I know they do. I tell them every day, and I try to show them every day how much I love them, and that they get tired of it. I ask them. I'm like, hey, you, hey, girls, you know what I figured out today? And you know what? They'll, they'll look at me. They'll go, we know, Daddy, you love us more today than yesterday. And they'll, like, walk away, right? And I try to tell them that all the time. And, I, and I, I told my wife, I'm like, I want them to trust me so much that anything I tell them to do, they'll do because they know I've got their best interests. And right now, they don't have to really ask me for much. I know, I know what they need. I know what brings them joy because I'm their father. But if I, as an imperfect father, know what my daughters want and need, imagine how much God knows about what we want and need. My challenge for you would be this. In times of prayer, from time to time, don't ask God for anything. Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that we don't have to ask God. God already knows what we want and what we need. Simply say, God, I trust you. I belong to you. You're my father and you're the perfect father. I trust that you're going to bless me and take care of me. I trust you. I believe that if we stop asking God for what we want and instead let him put what he wants in our lives, he'll bless us beyond imagination. If we'll just get out of the way and let him have his way. And I know it's a tall order. It's a daily struggle. But I would just, listen, pray. 
pray for purpose, pray for vision, pray for faith, pray for trust, and, and, and put all these in, in, in action in your life, and you'll grow. You'll grow in your relationship with Jesus. God's got an amazing plan for your life. And listen, some of y'all right now, you might be sitting here, I don't know. I, this is between you and God, your heart. You go, I don't have any of that stuff. I, I've never, I, I've been so afraid to really surrender my life to Jesus because I've been afraid of what it might look like. You can, listen, you are one prayer away from belonging to him. And maybe today, maybe today you need to come and pray, just spend some time with him. Maybe it's gotten so noisy in your world that you've, you, you've forgotten what his voice sounds like. And we need to start to listen up to what he wants to say to our hearts and in our lives so that we can better follow Jesus. Amen? Let's pray together this morning.